high school through postdocs, and what's the next thing for each of these levels is different. But what, what we're thinking about is, are they doing the things that propel them, move them forward on the pipeline to STEM? This is the model that guides us. On the left-hand side, these five boxes are the, the typical activities that are available both in programmatic situations and in non-programmatic research situations. When a, when a professor says to a student, you know, I think you've got a lot of potential, come and work in my lab. Uh, he, he may not have a program or she may not have a program, but there are elements of these programs. So Patricia Gondra at UC Davis develop these five. Doing research, being involved in research, being mentored, getting mentoring on, along instrumental lines, that is learning how to do things, and social emotional, getting uh, mentoring that supports you and uh, as an individual. Community involvement is a term we use that includes um, hanging around with other scientists, hanging around with faculty and adult scientists, hanging around with peer scientists, Sometimes this could be called networking, but this goes beyond networking. This is like the pizza party that the lab has around Christmas time or whatever. Academic support, which many of these programs have, which includes tutoring, and financial support, of course, uh, supporting these students so they can engage in this work. The outcomes that we are interested in are the outcomes that we're all interested in. We want to know, are there, are there improvements in performance? Do the students know how to do science? Are they are they developing their skills as, as scientists? Are they developing their leadership skills? Are they becoming committed to a career? Do they, do they increase the likelihood, their subjective likelihood of going on? Are they satisfied and, and so on? Now, the, the thrust, the, 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 the gist of our approach is that these variables affect these variables only by affecting these mediators. These psychological variables, that is, one's belief in their ability to do science, one's belief in their ability to be a leader or a follower, one's sense of identity and belongingness are the things that change along the path to changing these outcomes. And that even if a student has all of, this, all of these opportunities, if these things don't change, then these things won't change. So we're saying that the outcomes are mediated by, uh, by these intervening variables. And, and uh, this down here suggests that maybe issues like ethnicity and gender and uh, stage of development will modify the strength of these relationships. So let's, uh, just a, a bit of definitions. Self-efficacy is a, is a concept developed by Albert Bandura from Stanford University. A belief in one's abilities to organize and execute courses of action required to produce given attainment. So this is the sense that I can do this. I have to do this. Um, this efficacy is what is called domain specific. That is, you could be, you could consider yourself a good scientist and a lousy golfer. And I don't know why that particular example occurs to me, but. <laughs> and, uh, so, okay, so how does it work? How, how does self-efficacy have these effects? Well, on the cognitive level, we know that people who are confident in their ability have greater analytic complexity. And these come from actual studies where uh, people f solve problems. And the people who are more confident solve those problems at a more complex level. They integrate more information. And we know that students who enter a class with, um, with confidence about their ability to perform take a much more strategic approach to the course. So, for example, a student who thinks that they're going to do really well in a course uh, that has a paper, they might start thinking about what they're going to do the, on their paper in the second week, as we suggest to them, <laughs> rather than in the week before the final, uh, and they have to rush everything through. So they, they're more strategic. They also tend to have these effects on motivation. One is they set goals. And the more confident you are, the more difficult uh, the goals you are willing to set. And there's a vast literature in organizational psychology that suggests setting specific and difficult goals results in higher performance. But also, one of the, one of the most important mechanisms here is what we call self-regulation, which means that the person who is acting, their motivation level makes them maintain 
of self-evaluation, a constant awareness of how they're performing, and modification if the trajectory that they see before them is not sufficient to reach the goal that they have laid out. So when you're self-regulating, this is intrinsically driven, and it's a much po more powerful and efficient means of motivation than any kind of external motivation, like uh, giving people candy or whipping them if they don't make it. <laughs> <laughs> Identity refers to the student's sense that this is somebody who they are. And in our measures of this identity, we have two parts. One part is, um, I think being a scientist is the kind of person I am. And uh, as you'll see, a big part of that is actually efficacy. I think I'm good at this, so I think I could do this. But also, I think that my personal self, who I am, who I see myself as, my background, my gender, my ethnicity, all the things that make up our sense of identity, um, are they compatible with being uh, uh, a scientist? Because we've all heard stories for underrepresented students whose friends or family say, what? You're going to do that? That's not us. We don't do that. Um, so, uh, and the other part is that they believe that they will be accepted into the community of scientists. So they feel a sense of belonging. So we say here, uh, this is who they are, and they feel that they'd be comfortable. Well, this is important, very, very important, because one, we all know this, we've all been there, and we see it every day at school, identity development can be confusing. We come to college with multiple worlds, we come from multiple worlds, we have multiple identities, and uh, Erickson, the psychologist Erickson said, the, the major purpose of late adolescence is to integrate these identities, to become an adult with a sense of who, who one is. So when a student is being exposed to some course of study that requires, that, that induces a self, sort of a new identity, they have to somehow figure out how to square that with their current identity. And uh, second, of course, unfortunately, some social identities carry negative stereotypes. So this is the notion of stereotype threat, that certain members of our society are erroneously stereotyped as not intelligent or not capable. And they know that those stereotypes exist, and that creates tension for them in any situation in which that is at issue. And that can make the barriers to success in a field like STEM with mathematics and so on, difficult subjects, difficult. And one of the other things we know, and in fact, uh, Jamie Franco Zamudio, my professor of uh, Spring Hills College in Alabama, actually showed us this, that academics, as have other researchers, academic sense is very much based on a sense of fit, that I belong in this environment. So we have modified, so oh, let me back up and just say, that that first slide I showed you with the model, we had done eight or nine studies, uh, quantitative, qualitative, longitudinal, and, and case studies, and basically that was very well supported. The, the, uh, the relationship of program components to performance through the vehicle of self-efficacy and uh, identity. Uh, I don't have time to show you this, but I've got uh, half a dozen slides, actually, that I had to drop because I never could have finished my talk uh, that support this. So when we rewrote our uh, our proposal for renewal, we said, we got to get a little closer now. We gotta, our, jo our job is not just to find out neat things. It's to find out neat things that can help. And so uh, we, how can we get closer to the phenomenon? And we turn to the sources of self-efficacy that have been um, uh, uh, iterated by Dr. Bandura. So, an active mastery, vicarious role modeling, social persuasion, and emotional experience. And the idea is that these are the avenues by which research experience, for example, includes um, inquiry, uh, has an effect on science inquiry self-efficacy. So mastery experience, here are the four again. Mastery experience, and this is some of our scales that we use to study this, means that my experience tells me I can do this. So I uh, 
my professor told me that uh, I'm a good student. Uh, I feel comfortable, I, I'm fast. I, I solve the problems faster than other students. Vicarious experience is learning about your likelihood of success by looking at other people and, and measuring their success. And of course, if people that look like you um, are successful, it increases your subjective probability that you too can be successful because a similar person. So for example, if your older sibling goes to college and does well, then you say, oh, well, hey, I can, I'm just as smart as she is, so I can do well. Uh, so that's vicarious experience. It also involves looking at other people and seeing how they're doing and, and using that to judge how well you're doing. Verbal persuasion refers to uh, what people tell you about what you're doing. And most of us in this room, I guess, I would, I would hypothesize, had parents who told us we were smart and that we could do anything. Uh, because we start to believe that after a while. They keep saying it over and over. I remember the time I got a D in arithmetic in the fourth grade, and my mother told me I was too smart to get a D. And I said, gee, I wonder how she knows that because my teacher thinks I'm dumb enough to get a D. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last area is emotional experience, which is essentially how you feel when you're, when you're doing science. You know, so National Geographic comes out, and you go, oh, cool. You know, they're going to talk about uh, species differentiation or something. It's exciting. Or when you're in the laboratory, you just kind of feel like, oh, man, this is cool. I like that. So that's, that is our um, hypothesis. Our initial hypothesis was that these four variables, which we can measure with self-report scales, will have an impact on efficacy, which will in turn have an impact on performance and commitment. Well, what we found was not exactly what we were looking for, which is why we do research, because if we knew it all ahead of time, we would just, we could write the textbooks. <laughs> what happened was, we factor analyzed these scales. Now, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with factor analysis, but when you have a number of, of scales like this on a questionnaire, you can submit them to an analysis which looks to see where, where items are clustered, where there's kind of a, a, a vector, or a, you know, in, in a sense, a mathematical vector that, that draws these items. So instead of four, mastery and verbal persuasion and so on, we came up with two. One was related to performance-based sources, which is all the things that tell you you're doing good, not differentiated by who told you, not whether your mother told you or your your peers or your role models or your professors or your performance, all of those came together and these were things that people said, yeah, this, this, I, I learned about who I, how good I am by this. The other one was what we call ecological fit from the literature on student attrition and student commitment and satisfaction, which, which has quite a volume of research suggesting that when people feel they belong in an environment, that they fit, that there's a good match between their skills and their goals and their values and the place that they're studying. So these are, uh, I'm happy to be in school. I just love being on campus. Uh, I've seen uh, people like me who do this and so on and so on. So now, we, instead of going with the four sources, we take that and, and create a measures out of these two sources and this is what we find. Here are uh, ultimately the things that we end up measuring from the activity side. Mentoring, research experience, networking, community involvement. We also have a thing in here about negative mentoring. You know, most people who study mentoring, it's like you say mentoring and then a shaft of light appears from that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there are bad mentors, you know. I'm sure we've all had bad mentors. So bad mentoring is not better than no mentoring. It's worse than no mentoring. So we have, we have questions here where we ask students, does your mentor make you feel stupid sometimes? Does your mentor make you feel like you're not important? Like, they doesn't, like he or she doesn't understand what you're trying to do? Uh, and then social-emotional mentoring, which refers to the kind of mentor who sits you down and says, don't worry, I understand it. Let me just tell you a little bit about, you know, how hard what you're trying to do is and why it feels hard to you because it felt hard to me and a lot of other people I know. So don't, you know, don't give up on yourself. So, so these things, the performance,
performance, things related to performance, like being taught how to be a scientist, by doing the work, by being around scientists, all contribute. Oh, um, I'll get back to this in a minute. These performance-based sorts. So let me, I'm sorry I didn't say this at the beginning. This uh, figure is a path analysis uh, that comes from a structural equation model. And I know I'm off in probabilistic statistics, which isn't the, what most of you study. Um, essentially, we put the data, we tell the computer, this is what we think are the relationships. The computer fits that to see if, in fact, your explanation of the data is better than any other fit possible. And it does this separating each of these from each other. Um, you know, in these problems, you have a, 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 in these kinds of studies, you have a problem of multicollinearity, which is a fancy way of saying everything is correlated with everything. So when we are looking at instrumental memory here, it's adjusted for all these other things. So that variance that's not instrumental memory has been removed. So uh, if the, these are all significant by that measure. And so, and this, if you, if, uh, you or me knew, knew more about these measures, you'd see that these are very, very strong fit statistics that say uh, this, is a good, this is a good prediction. Okay, so the performance-based things have a direct effect on, on efficacy, uh, have, and also there's a direct from experience bypassing the feedback. Um, being around scientists, uh, not getting negative mentoring, having good social emotional mentoring, see that's a negative there, uh, contribute to ecological fit, to that, that the, the student who says, boy, I'm, I'm really happy to be on campus. And both of these uh, predict identity, and that is the, that is the point where everything comes together because identity is the closest and strongest predictor of commitment to a science career. And that's one of the reasons that this conference is so unique and so valuable, because this is a place where underrepresented student, science students can come and see a massive array of underrepresented scientists who, like our speaker today at lunch, who say, look, I know what you're coming from, I know what you're going through, but it's possible. We can do it, you can do it, I did it, you can do it. So, uh, and I always love going to that powwow on Saturday night and seeing the physicists and the chemists turn into dancers and the students think to themselves, yeah, okay, you can be a dancer and you can be a physicist, that's cool. Okay, so, so that's, um, I think that might be uh, my last slide. So, so what we're saying is that these two things, which have been around in this, in the literature on student performance for a long time, that is uh, thinking that you're capable, thinking that you like it, leads to a sense that this is a career goal for you. I don't know how many, have any of you ever heard of uh, Lenz, L-E-N-Z, his work? Well, he has a model of career uh, choice. And in his model of career choice, you find the same thing. That believing you can do something helps to create an identity and then believing that this is something you'd like to do, you know, that this is a worthwhile thing to be doing, this is who I am, then they both lead to a commitment in science. And this is our team, it's a very large team because it's a, we have a lot of different folk side, both qualitative and quantitative research, and we also include uh, some uh, non-social scientists who help us understand the scientific, uh, some of the scientific issues that are related. So, uh, and you see that Marigold Linton, who was one of my colleagues at uh, the University of Utah when I was an assistant professor, is now the uh, SACNAS board president. Uh, and, and so we had, some, we had some assistance from people like that who we knew in the field. Anyway, this is basically irrelevant. I'm just running off in the mouth. So, uh, are we going to take questions? We will.
So uh, the question is, how prevalent is this way of thinking among the, the people who run the programs, the science faculty in the universities and colleges who run the programs? Well, first of all, let me say that the people who pay for my research are the people who give the money out for the program. So it's very much in their interest that this research contribute to the knowledge. And then just about every year, I go to the big program directors meeting, and I tell them about this. And I must tell you that in, in my experience, they are delighted to learn new stuff. Uh, on our campus, we have tremendous support from, um, from our scientists. Uh, uh, Barry Bowman, who is the chair of the biology department on our campus, and runs a MARC program, MDRS, uh, is, uh, He's, he said, I'm so glad you're doing this because we don't know how to do this, but we need to know this stuff. So yes, and that's why I said that my, my job is to figure out what will work because these are people in the field who are waiting to know and what I'm trying to do is elucidate these steps in the model so that I can take the professors who are in the programs and say, okay, let me, let me give you some insight into what your students are feeling. You better pay attention to this and that. And I, uh, we, Amanda asked me to give her some of my ideas about uh, why this stuff is important, what, what I've learned, and she's going to do some stuff with it later. I, I don't know, you know, these education people are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, when I saw community involvement initially, I thought it meant some connection between the, the student slash scientist and their ethnic community mm -hmm. or their, you know, their family, familial community. Right. And, and the tension there an identity between science and yeah. my home community. Have you done, is there much in the model here that sort of looks at, at that particular tension? Well, let's just talk about the one side first. Um, as I mentioned, Dr. Franco Zamudio <coughs> did a study of graduate students in the UC system, and she, she interviewed systems all across, uh, students all across the UC system who were right at that stage in their career before they take their oral exams, their, uh, their qualifying. And this, as we all know, is a real moment of truth. Uh, you know, if you're scared, you can't pass your qualifiers. You start thinking about why you're really meant to be a basketball player and you know, <laughs> or whatever. And one of the things that she found, one of the overwhelming findings, was that among the women and underrepresented graduate students who felt that they were doing well, who, who and who later turned out to be doing well, because we we follow these people, they all had an attachment an organization that brought together their ethnic identity and their um, and their scientific identity. The Hispanic engineers, the women in, okay, 